Hey everybody, this is Russ from Retro Game Core. So I've made it no secret that I love the PAL Kitty RGB10. I think it's a really neat device and it's one of my favorites that use the RK3326 chipset. And there are newer versions of this console available now, but I also recently learned that there's a website called Retro Game Case that also has packages that allow you to upgrade it yourself. And the person who owns it actually has their own YouTube channel called Always Be Fun where they do all sorts of cool mods and stuff like that. So I was lucky enough to get one of these kits sent over me to try out myself to upgrade my RGB10. And I really love my new upgraded RGB10. It's probably one of my favorite handhelds now. And not because it's the most powerful device in the world or anything else like that, but because it feels like my own console because I put it together myself. So here are the upgrades I did. First, I added an OCA laminated display and they have a black or a white border available for you. And then I also added a metal shell, which has six different color options. I like the light blue one, but there are lots of other colors you can choose. It also has a larger battery. I'd say it's about 25% larger than the original battery that it came with. And the kit also comes with a PS Vita analog stick that you can put onto your device. I had already done this mod myself, but it's something you can do as well. And last but not least, it comes with an upgraded speaker. It doesn't increase the volume on the device, but it has much better quality sound. So altogether, that's a pretty impressive list of upgrades to do on one device. So if you head over to their website, which is myretrogamecase.com, you'll see you have two different buying options. The first one is a fully formed console. So it's actually $135 and it comes with the RGB 10 plus all of those upgrades I just mentioned before. So you can pick out your color and your different layout and everything else. You can also pick up between a thick and a slim version. The thin version is smaller and lighter at the expense of the USB port. And personally, I would recommend you go with the thick version because the functionality of the USB port is really nice. Now Pal Kitty sells a metal version and it doesn't have all the bells and whistles of this one and it is five dollars cheaper but it only has one color. Now in addition to a whole new console you can also just upgrade your own console and on the website they give you all sorts of options between all the different colors you can choose from as well as different packages so you can tailor which things you actually want to buy and which ones you don't. Now as you saw earlier I went with the blue version but I think the green one looks pretty cool too and honestly the pink one's pretty nice as well. Now the first package starts at $55 and that's just the case itself, but then as you go further you can get more and more things and the discounts get higher and higher. Personally I went with package F, that includes the OCA laminated screen, the speaker, the joystick, as well as the upgraded battery. But there are packages that include even more options, for example you can get upgraded buttons as well. I stuck with the original buttons, but that's something you could do. So if you look, the grand total of package F, which is the one I got, was $82 altogether. And sure, you might be saying to yourself, hey, this is the same price as a full new console, but you know, you get to tailor it yourself, and honestly, I like putting it together as well. You can get the RGB 10 Pro, which has a new screen as well as a bigger battery, and it's $85, but you have to deal with that ugly blue color, and it won't have the upgraded speaker or the Vita analog stick. So I think the argument could be made that the upgrade is actually a pretty good value. All right, so here we are with my original RGB 10. You can see all I've done to it is change the PSV analog stick, everything else is stuck. But honestly, I love the face buttons, I like the shoulder buttons, and I'm happy to be able to use those again. And I like the plastic shell on the original one, but at the same time, I'm excited to try the premium version as well. Now here's how the kit came for me. He also threw in a screen protector for my RG351P because I'd specifically asked for it. But otherwise, let me just show you what else is in the package. So here's the OCA laminated screen. Here's the upgraded Sony battery. And then here you can see is the iPhone speaker as well as the screws for the new case as well as some new start and select buttons. Some adhesive glue to put the screen on and then the metal shell case. And as you can see here, it has different start and select buttons, and I like these a lot better. They just make a lot more sense in the case than the previous one. Other than that, everything else looks the same. Okay, so let's start taking apart the old one so we can put it into the new one. First thing, you need to take out these little nubs. I found that using tweezers is probably the best, but my tweezers kind of suck, so it took me a while to actually get them out myself. And these are just Phillips head screws here. Now to pry open the case itself, you can either use a fingernail or you can use a plastic spudger like I do right here. All you have to do is just unlatch that clip there. And this is what it looks like inside. It's a very simple case here. So just remove all your shoulder buttons and put them to the side. 
And then you can unlatch the speaker cable as well as the battery cable. And they're kind of tied in there, so just take a minute and just kind of pull them out gently. There are two screws holding in the logic boards. You can take those out. And don't forget your reset and power buttons as well. Next, we're going to remove the analog stick. It's just going to be two screws, and then there's a little ribbon cable you have to remove. You just unlatch it and pull it out. Same thing with the ribbon cable for the display. You just have to unlatch it and pull it out. And that's it. Here's your logic board. There's some interesting soldering they did for my USB port. Maybe that won't be for yours, but mine it looked a little weird. Okay, let's finish disassembling here. So next you're going to want to take off your silicon membranes behind your buttons and D-pad. And then remove your D-pad and your face buttons. And then start and select. And then your plus and minus buttons. Something I noticed is that both displays have the same model number. The real difference here is the fact that the other one is OCA laminated. That means you're not going to get any dust in your screen, and it's not going to have as much glare. Overall, it's just going to be a much nicer screen. And this is what it's going to look like when it's fit inside the device itself. If you look on the inside of the case, you'll see that there are three different spaces there, and that's where you're going to put the glue, as well as where you're going to rest the screen itself. On the other side, you're just going to latch it in, and that's going to be on the analog side. So you basically slide in the side that has the ribbon cable, and then you just press it down onto the adhesive. Now we're supposed to use a T7000 adhesive here, which is a rubber adhesive, and that'll make it easier to remove it later on, so you don't want to use something like super glue. You can use this or double-sided tape. The only issue I ran into is the fact that the glue had kind of dried up and I was not able to actually get it out of the tube itself. I probably spent a half hour trying to coax this stuff out, and I never actually got it out. I tried squeezing and poking, all these other things. It never happened. And admittedly, I was being a little bit lazy. I didn't want to go over to the hardware store. So all I did is I just cut it open and then I used a needle to actually apply it. This was pretty dumb of me, but man, I just really wanted to get it done. So I started with the little applicator needle here and I had a little bit of problem getting it on. As you can see, it was kind of halfway dry already. So I ended up using a sewing needle and then I just put the rest of it on. And man, I made a huge mess here. I like It got really ugly, but you know what? I was like, I'm just going to try it, and if it doesn't work out, it's easy to remove, and then I can try it in a different day. And honestly, it all worked out okay. So yeah, here I am just kind of making a huge mess of everything, and I was like, you know what? It's fine. You know, if it, if it doesn't work out, I can always just go and buy new stuff in a different day, but I just wanted to see how it would work, at least this one time. And it turned out that I used about the exact amount of adhesive that I needed to keep everything in place. And it definitely got a little messy. I tried to rub it off with a paper towel. That didn't work because it was too sticky. So I ended up using my own finger for a little bit. And then I found a microfiber towel and I made it damp. And then I was able to actually clean up the edges before I applied the screen itself. And they sell a clear adhesive that's easier to work with. So maybe get that instead. So you can see here, I'm working pretty quickly here because I'm worried that the glue is going to dry out. I remove the case here and then I just kind of push it together. And then I made a point to remove all of the excess adhesive so that way it didn't look too bad. Okay, so here's a preliminary look to everything. After it all dried, I was able to get my fingernail in there and scrape out the rest of it, and it actually looked really nice afterwards, which I'll show you later in the video. Now, because we're not using super glue, it's going to take about 20 minutes of pressure to keep the screen in place. Now, you could use a rubber band, but personally, I used a book. And now's a, probably a pretty good time to tell you that A Hundred Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez is one of the greatest novels written in the past century. It came out in 1970, and I personally have read it about five times. It's just a beautiful, magical book. It also works really well for holding a screen down. So you can either weigh this down for about 20 minutes, or you can use a rubber band to keep it in place. Personally, I just stacked a bunch of other books on top of it, walked away, and then came back 20 minutes later. It's all up to you. Okay, so now comes the fun part. This is where we get to put everything back together. So first thing, put all your face buttons together. The nice thing is because these aren't labeled or anything, it doesn't matter which ones you put in where. You can then add your D-pad and your plus and minus function buttons. And then your start and select buttons. And these also aren't labeled, so it doesn't matter which order you put them in. Then your silicone membranes to make sure that everything fits nicely. And then your silicone membranes. So the only tricky thing about adding the logic board is how you use that flex ribbon cable. You basically are going to push it in towards the LCD panel and then bend it back as you put the logic board in. 
and then just snake that ribbon cable into its slot and then clamp it down. And then before you do anything else, I would secure the logic board in place just to make sure everything's in place. And I have to say these new screws they're using are much better than the older screws. And before you go and put anything else in, I would flip it around and make sure all the buttons work appropriately. Next, let's do the analog stick. So this is pretty easy. All you have to do is just slide it in here and then just push in the ribbon cable and latch it shut. And then just screw it back together. Now you can add your shoulder buttons, as well as the power and reset buttons. Okay, we're done with that side of the board, now let's move over to the back. So to apply the battery, we're just going to basically mimic the old style and make sure it's put in the same place. And same thing with this speaker. Now the speaker horn is actually this little hole here, and so that's where the sound's going to come out, so you're going to want to point that down. And there's a little sticker on one side. You can either actually attach that to the logic board or you can do it to the back of the case like I'm gonna do here. Now, unfortunately, I didn't have any nice puffy double-sided tape on me at the time. And these probably aren't the best things to use with an electronic device, but I figured, you know what, I'll try these out and if they don't work, then I'll go and buy some double-sided tape. If you haven't figured it out already, I'm totally a cheapskate, so I'm gonna use what I have at home before I go to the store and buy anything else. So initially I just tried to use the sticker on the back of the case for the speaker here, and I found that it just wasn't secured enough. I think that if you were going to apply this to the logic board, it probably would be nice and sticky, but just with the angle that it was stuck in, I didn't think it worked very well with the metal case. So I ended up pulling it off and then using one of those glue dots just to make sure it stayed in place. And now it's much more secure. And then same thing for the battery here. I ended up using three different glue dots, and this worked perfectly for me. The only worry I have is that as the battery heats up while it's in use, it might remove some of the adhesiveness of that glue dot, and so I will probably use double-sided tape eventually, but for now, this is just what I did to put it all together for the first time. At the end of the day, all you're really trying to do is prevent these components from moving around within the case, and I think this is going to work nicely. Okay, now we're wrapping it up. All we have to do is plug in the speaker cable and the battery, and they're actually labeled on the logic board if you can't remember which one's the speaker one and which one's the battery one. Now when you put the case together, you want to make sure that none of those wires are poking out from the speaker or the battery, so it might take a couple tries just to make sure everything's nice and seated. After that, it's just a matter of screwing these four screws back in. And here we are, a fully finished RGB10 metal premium case, customized for my needs and put together by yours truly. So moment of truth here, let's put in the SD card and make sure it doesn't explode. And look at that, Arc OS comes right up. Right off the bat, I can tell that this screen is such an upgrade from the original one. I love these laminated screens, and I'm so happy that one of my favorite devices now has the laminated screen on it. And on top of that, I love these kind of white accents to it as well. So to start, let's test out the audio quality and see if you can tell a difference here. So I'm gonna crank up the volume. In person, I can definitely tell that it sounds better, and on top of that, I think using it inside of a metal case gives it a little bit more of a resonant audio. It's very nice. In general, these controls are just awesome. Like, I really love the premium feel of metal like this, and you know, honestly, it's not a very heavy case either. Like, it just doesn't feel like it's a burden to hold, sometimes like the RG351M or the RG350M can feel like. So speaking of weights, let's check that out. So it's 200 grams for this metal case here. And honestly, I forgot to weigh the original RGB 10, so I'm not sure what it actually weighs originally. If someone wants to leave a comment and let me know, I'd really appreciate that. But you can see with the RG351M, it's 265 grams. So the RG351M is about 32% heavier than the RGB 10 metal case. And then you can see here that the RG351P, the plastic version, is about the same weight now as the metal RGB 10. Now on the other side of the spectrum, here is the Palkitty Q90, which I haven't reviewed yet, but I really like this device, and it's only 123 grams, so it's like the smaller version of the RGB10. Now even though they're about the same weight, you can see there's a huge size difference between the RG351P and then the RGB10 here. Now obviously the RG351P has dual analog sticks, so it has a little bit other features that the RGB10 doesn't have, but I really like the smaller size of the RGB10 itself. Another thing I want to point out is the white balance on the display here. That's something I also didn't like about the original RGB10. I felt that it was too warm and too yellow. 
but you can see here the white balance is almost equal between these two devices. I would say that the RGB 10 is still significantly warmer than the RG351P, but it's a much tighter race at this point. And even though the white balance is a little bit warmer, I do think it's well balanced. So if you look here at the bottom of this theme, the red looks like a perfect color of red. Whereas if you look at the RG351P, it almost has a purplish kind of hue to it. And that might be because it's right next to a blue color. But at the same time, I like the color of the red on the RGB 10 here on that part. And you can see it's not a perfect white. So for example, the white of the border is a little bit wider than the white in the Nintendo logo here but I still think this is miles better than the original screen when it comes to white balance. Now, another thing I noticed is that the RG351P display is definitely brighter than the RGB10 display. And that might be a big deal to you, say for example, if you like to play your device outdoors. But at this point, I'm probably just nitpicking. So I would say, you know, they're both beautiful displays. One definitely is brighter than the other, and the RG351P has a cooler white balance than the RGB10. Now, when it comes to the feel of another metal device, so for example, the RG351M, this one does feel a little bit more balanced, but honestly, I hate these little rubber pads on the back of my device. As you can see here with the RG350M, the glue has been coming undone here. And this is one of my big pet peeves, and I've been meaning to remove these pads and just kind of take all this glue off with some alcohol, but I've never found a use for these rubber pads, and to me, they're more of an annoyance than anything. So I appreciate that the RGB10 has a smooth back, and I don't have to worry about those pads at all. To me, it feels like the RG351M is kind of a ticking time bomb, like it's only a matter of time before this glue starts to leak. So let me show you some close-ups here of the shell. You can just see how beautifully made it is. Everything looks just nice and machine crafted. I love that the buttons don't have any labels on them. Everything just looks nice and smooth. I love all the contrast of white on blue like this. It just makes it feel very clean and modern. The D-pad feels great and I really love this analog stick. The only downside is it's not clickable, so you don't have an L3 option here. But one of the things I really love about this analog stick is it has a lot of room to travel. So as you can see here, it never gets close to touching the sides of the case here. And so it just feels like you have a lot more freedom while you're controlling the device when using this analog stick. All right, everyone, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun putting all this together. And I'm really tempted to say at this point with an RGB 10 with a metal case like this that I've put together myself, that this is my favorite device that I've ever had. And it's not because it's the most powerful, because it isn't, but it's because it's mine. All right, I'm out of here. Let me know if you have any questions in the comments below. Be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful, and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.